Israel pounds Hamas while Biden calls for a ceasefire. House Democrats move the January 6th commission onto the Senate. The CDC chief says we aren't out of the woods yet, and Kamala has an enemies list of reporters who don't understand her. Nobody really thinks that Benjamin Netanyahu is going to do what Joe Biden says, right? We, we all understand that. I know that there's a close relationship between uh, Israel and the U.S. and that they are a strong ally in the Middle East on so many issues. But it's as I've been saying all along, when someone threatens you with lethal force, you, your family, your people with lethal force, you do what you have to do to stop that threat. Everything else just starts to sound like noise. Everything outside of that is a secondary consideration at best. And I do want there to be a ceasefire, and I understand that desire, but I also know that it will come when the Israelis no longer have concerns about an imminent threat from Hamas rockets and and Hamas terrorist acts. That's just the way this is going to play out. So we have to keep focused on that. But the, the thing for me that's, that's pretty fascinating to watch it play out is how the left in this country manages to show us so many of the, the philosophical dysfunctions that they bring to domestic political issues you see in the context of Israel and the Palestinians. So many of the misconceptions, the moral relativism, the obsession with victimology, the view of everything through a racial and ethnic lens, so much of that is apparent. And in that way, I think that this can be instructive for all of us because you see that the left approaches everything, foreign policy, domestic policy, economic issues, national security issues, applying these same intellectually bankrupt, morally rotten approaches. They use relativism, victimology, Marxism, critical race theory, which is really just a, a, a cousin, an, an offshoot uh, on the family tree of Marxism. But they apply those frameworks to it, and that's how they end up with absurd things. That's how they end up saying very, very stupid things and not, it seems as though they're not able to figure out the most basic concepts of foreign policy. Who are your friends? Who are your enemies? Do they know the difference? Does it matter? That's just start with that approach. Whenever you're talking, and by the way, that's just a good framework for, for pretty much life. But it certainly works on the world stage. Who are your friends? Who are your enemies? Do they know the difference? Does it matter? Does it matter? And uh, it seems that there are a lot of people in this country who have a strange affinity for Hamas a terrorist death cult that will execute people for any number of crimes, uh, real or imagined, that will kill people who oppose the regime with impunity, that will, that will kill homosexuals, uh, that will kill people for a whole range of not actual crimes, but Hamas is a terrorist organization that will determine that there must be an extreme punishment. They will throw people off of buildings. It's a mafia state with some jihadist flavor thrown in. That's what's really the essence of Hamas, an offshoot of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, in its origins. This should be quite clear. Any of you who have been to Israel, as I have, know it's a rule of law, well-functioning state where people just want to live their lives in peace and want to pursue their own dreams and, and have their own freedoms. You know, you have Palestinian members of the Knesset. You have Palestinians who have senior posts in government. And they support the Israeli efforts to stop the rocket fire from coming down all over Israel. They, they agree with them. I mean, I'll tell you this right now. For all my criticism of the Biden administration, if China invaded tomorrow... I'd be talking about how I want to be shoulder to shoulder with good old Uncle Joe and all the crazy libs repelling that invasion. You know, there are some things that really do bring people together. 
And when you're living in a small country, it's like the size of New Jersey, and you are getting hit with rockets all over the place, it is very understandable in those circumstances. It's very understandable that you're going to rally behind leadership and want your national government, want your armed forces to do everything they can to keep you safe. And yet, the idiots of the American left see a moral equivalency here in some ways, or, or they, they can't seem to, to compute all of this. They don't seem to understand, well, why is it that the Israelis end up killing more Palestinians than, than Hamas ends up killing Israelis? Well, because they're in this for very different reasons, trying to achieve very different ends. Hamas also started it, which is another very important fact to keep in mind as we go through all this. But for me, more than anything else, this, this illuminates some of the core dysfunctions of left-wing thinking. This shows you why not only do they get it wrong on Israel-Palestine, they get it wrong on so many things, in so many areas. There's a, a deficiency in their approach. Uh, here's Chris Hayes of MSNBC, who... It seems to be an increasingly radical leftist over the years. He used to just be a kind of, you know, shrill beta male. But now he actually seems to want to pose as the revolutionary of sorts. But anyway, he, here he is. And by the way, before I, I play the audio here, I want to be clear. I don't want anyone dying in Israel or in Gaza. I wish there was no violence. And I certainly don't want innocent civilians to be killed. But Hamas forces a situation where that will happen. And in fact, and there's plenty of proof of this, because they do have a cult of martyrdom. So to call it a death cult is by no means an exaggeration. You can even see there are, there are mothers of suicide bombers that have been interviewed of, of Hamas and, and other uh, jihadist anti-Israel entities in the West Bank, the Gaza Strip. Uh, there are interviews with the parents with with mothers even of young of young boys who have been suicide bombers in israel and they are considered shaheed they are martyrs and they celebrate this they think that this was a good thing a good idea to go in and strap this is from years back when this was a constant threat against the israelis but they would send individuals with suicide vests into a crowded cafe in tel aviv or in jerusalem and try to murder and maim as many people just who happen to be trying to get a drink, trying to see friends, see family. That's Hamas's version of their, their glorious resistance. I mean, true evil, really evil personified. And yet Chris Hayes sits here saying, why don't we get an Iron Dome for Gaza? Play 19. You know, I, I, there's been these images I've seen of, of the, the Iron Dome system, right? So this, this missile defense system the U.S. partly funded uh, that has been intercepting Hamas rockets into Israel. And those rockets are being fired, uh, as a Palestinian human rights lawyer said, said on this show last night, indiscriminately civilians, a war crime by definition. And the Iron Dome has worked quite well. Today, some got through. I think two uh, uh, Thai nationals and Israeli died as a result. But I look at those images and I think, well, good. That, that's good. I'm glad that those rockets are being intercepted. And I also, there's some part of me, it's like, can we get an Iron Dome for Gaza? Can the American taxpayer foot the bill to protect innocent children in Gaza, where there's 2 million people in one of the most densely parted, uh, populated parts of the world so that they don't have death rain down upon them? The Iron Dome in Gaza is for Hamas to stop firing rockets. Then they'd have a de facto Iron Dome because Israelis don't want to bomb Gaza. How does... A primetime host at MSNBC not understand this because it's yet another deficiency of left-wing thinking, bringing moral relativism into this, as if the situations are the same, as if there's a, an equivalency here between Israeli airstrikes on positions that are Hamas militants, where, yes, there are and will be civilian casualties that are part of that, too, and the Hamas approach, which is just kill anybody you can, as many as you can, go for it, do it as often as possible. If there was more parity among the military capabilities of Hamas and Israel, if we were anything near that, we would just have a bigger war. I think it was um, uh, Ari Fleischer 
who put out on Twitter, and I don't know if he coined this or if this is a quote from somebody else, but if Hamas disarmed, the violence would end tomorrow. If Israel disarmed, Hamas would end Israel. That's the truth. These are basic, fundamental understandings of the situation. So why does the left get this stuff so wrong? Because they apply the frameworks of uh, identity politics, racial Marxism, uh, victimology, co- uh, anti-colonial indoctrination. They apply all of those to this conflict today instead of just looking at it with clear eyes and saying, who's causing the violence and how do we stop the violence? I think it's uh, the media itself is finally beginning to air both sides of the dispute. Uh, Social media is doing things that you all are not able or willing to do. Uh, the images that people are seeing on social media, they cannot unsee. Uh, and I think that you have uh, changes that are going on. Things like the Tulsa riots, things like Black Lives Matter are seen as connected by a very large number of people, not just in the Democratic Party, but particularly particularly young people on campuses, uh, young people uh, all over the country. And I think this is something that's actually happening not just in the United States. Um, there's a lot of pushback. There will be even more pushback. But I think people are, are moving in the direction of understanding that, that much, many of these bromides, Israel has a right to defend itself. Well, do Palestinians have a right to defend themselves? Israel's security. The most insecure people in Palestine and Israel are Palestinians. And we talk about Israel's security. Uh, if people are people and we believe in human rights, which the United States supposedly stands for, then the kinds of things that we expect for ourselves, we should expect uh, for people, not just in Israel, but also in Palestine. Always be wary of eloquent, uh, sophomoric bullcrap like this. The bromides, he says, like Israel has a right to defend itself. Uh, yes, that is true. This is as I've said. They, they can try to tell people as much as they want that Israel shouldn't do what it is doing right now in response to these uh, Palestinian rocket attacks, Hamas rocket attacks. Remember, Hamas is the government of Gaza. So it's not like there's some little tiny fringe group that is firing some rockets that has nothing to do really with the the mass of the Palestinian people in Gaza. And Israel is just wildly overreacting to it and using it as an excuse to kick people out of their homes or take territory or whatever it may be. That's not happening right now. That's not the situation. But notice the connection made here by that uh, Rashid Khalidi guest on MSNBC. He refers to, uh, to Jim Crow. He, he refers to racial struggles in this country in the past. What does that have to do with Israel and Palestine? Well, I, I know that the left has all these different frameworks that they apply to them. They say, oh, but you know, Israel is an, is an ethno-nationalist state. And it's a terrible place. And, and I sit here and I say, how many Islamic states are there in the region? Do we ever hear them referred to as ethno-nationalist states? Yeah. Show up in Saudi Arabia and be like, hey, I'm a, I'm a white Christian or a, I'm a white Jew. And I demand you know, equal rights and equal treatment. See how that goes for you. But we, we get distracted here from the core of what's really happening. They, they want to always turn this into a a historical struggle. I'll say this, uh, or a, a historical debate. Um, it does remind me of, of when you're in something of a toxic relationship. Some of you have maybe been through this. I've been through this, unfortunately, in life. You're in a toxic relationship. What, what is a sign of a toxic relationship? When you try to address a problem and the other party in that relationship does not want to address the problem, and just wants to bring in other things that they disapprove of or don't don't like in order to go on offense against you and avoid or even nullify the problem that you have raised. This is very destructive, right? Hey, you know, I I invited you to this uh, to be my my date to the wedding and you were two hours late. And then it's, well, you didn't, you know, 
take me out to dinner on our anniversary and you said you would and we just had, you know, a, a, a cupcake instead or something, right? That's toxic. <laughs> it's, you, you have to deal with the issue you're talking about. You can always find a way to make it about something else to bring up some other issue and focus in on that. Here you have, uh, you know, people that are going to try all these different historical analogies and bring up all these things that are not really about the issue at hand. And it's because they don't want to deal with the fact that this is quite clear. This is a straightforward situation with the Israelis and Hamas. Right now, I'm talking about the fighting. I'm not saying their overall circumstance in the region. Yeah, I know a lot of history, a lot of enmity, a lot of bad blood and all kinds of stuff. But you fire rockets at people, they're going to come back and hit you, and they're going to try to stop you from being able to fire rockets like that again. They're not going to wait and see if you're going to be nice the next time. Basic reality of life. And if you're in a weaker position than they are, you shouldn't have fired rockets. Unwise. But Representative Jayapal, for example, is trying to find a way to make this about blaming Israel. Play seven. Well, we condemn Hamas's firing of those rockets, but I think you have to look at what prompted even that behavior. I think there was, uh, you know, the, the, the continuing annexation that Israel has been undertaking um, for years, actually. And, you know, Jake, I was at Khan al-Akmar several years ago when the bulldozers arrived to bulldoze that village. It was stopped by an injunction from the Supreme Court. But this has been a pattern of action from Israel that, frankly, has taken away the idea even of a two-state solution, has led to increased hopelessness from the Palestinian people. And I think what Hamas has done is obviously we condemn that, but we have to look at the power balance here, or imbalance as it were, and we have to put more responsibility on Israel. We condemn that, but... That's the construction that you'll hear all the time. That's the construct, rather, you'll hear all the time from leftists on this. We have to put more responsibility on Israel. You know what Israel was doing until a couple of weeks ago? Trying to get their people back to full free life after a mass vaccination campaign, trying to reopen, trying to have companies create really valuable intellectual property and prosperity for their own people and and. Patents and things that will be useful all over the world. That's what Israel was doing. What were they doing in Gaza? Yes, there were people going about their lives. I understand that, feeding themselves, sending their children to school. But what was the regime doing in Gaza? Stockpiling missiles to fire at Israel. Again, they can try to make this much more complicated. We can allow the faculty lounge of left-wing loons to frame this however they want. At the end of the day, this is not a situation that requires a particularly uh, adept mind to understand. All you have to do is look at what is happening and understand that there are good people and there are bad people in this world. There are good decisions and bad decisions. There is right and wrong. And the moment you just start to think in those terms, instead of using a lot of jargon and bringing in all kinds of Marxism and intersectionality, you say Israel is going to defend itself and the Palestinian people should find better leadership than Hamas. Joe Biden came in and in just four months, he's frittered all of that away. He's undermined Israel and Prime Minister Netanyahu. He sent over $100 million to the Palestinian Authority with the the PA, which is in bed with Hamas. Hamas, the terrorists that are firing those rockets you're showing right now, they fired over 4,000 rockets into Israel. And every one of those rockets might as well have Joe Biden's name written on the side of it because it is his weakness, his appeasement, his moral relativism and ambiguity, his lack of backbone to stand up and stand with Israel that is causing this war in the Middle East. Now, Biden is certainly out of his depth and is being tested in a, in a variety of ways and found wanting already. But I, I do have to say that 
we like to sometimes push this a little a little more as as a Biden issue on the right than it is a lot of other factors too. Now, would the mess around and find out approach of Hamas have been the same under a Trump administration? I don't think so. But I don't I don't know if it's quite accurate for uh, Ted Cruz to say the rockets fired might as well have Biden's name on it. Biden at our southern border. Yes. People are literally showing up with Biden T-shirts on and saying I'm here because of Biden. That's that's real. Biden rockets is a that's a that's a little Ted's pushing a little far on that one, Um, because here's the other side of this at the top level administrations both Democrat and Republican, have largely the same approach to Israel. Now, that was a bit different during the Obama years, but there was no Obama administration uh, ending of USA to Israel. There was no Obama administration. You know, Obama said things that showed Israelis that he had a particular soft spot for the Palestinian cause as a civil rights and human rights struggle, right? Said things that definitely irked people inside of Israel. There's no question about that. But if you look at the actions, it wasn't that different. It wasn't that different. And this is, this is where you see a lot of Democrats, uh, far-left Democrats, are upset. They're angry with their own side because they feel like, at the top level, the Schumers, the Pelosi's, they are pretty pro-Israel in their statements. You know, they'll call for a need to be even-handed and they'll call for a need to cease fire, but it's, it's not really going to do anything. They know that. They understand that they're just, uh, they're just posturing. Um, there are some who go a little, bit, a little bit further than this. I mean, they love to attack Netanyahu. They view Netanyahu as a, an Israeli conservative, right? They view Netanyahu as if the GOP existed in Israel, Netanyahu would be the head of it. That's the mentality that Democrats have. Uh, and so you have people like Senator Dick Durbin here who knows that he's not, he's not going to oppose Israel that much openly. Uh, he's not going to say anything that's going to upset uh, not just the Israelis, but Jewish American voters who also pay close attention to a lot of this commentary. And even friends of mine like David Harsanyi will, will say repeatedly and openly that they don't view anti-Israel sentiment as being different from anti-Semitism. You know, they, they don't view that as, as the great separation that others do. Uh, here's Dick Durbin talking about the policies of Netanyahu, though, who, who he is someone who is safe for the left to attack on this stuff. Play two. I couldn't disagree more with the policies of Bibi Netanyahu when it comes to the treatment of Palestinians and the establishment of settlements. I I think the two-state solution is the only realistic future in that part of the world, and the abandonment of that approach uh, by Netanyahu and his followers I don't believe is constructive and I think has added to the tension and stress between uh, Israel and the Palestinians. Uh, That's the reality, and I am certainly not going to endorse Netanyahu. Now let me add very quickly, I made a commitment early in my career that I'm standing by. I am going to support the survival of Israel. Those who want to uh, cut back on the protective missiles and such that they need, uh, I don't join in that. They live in a very dangerous neighborhood. Although I wholeheartedly disagree with the Netanyahu policy, I am going to stand by my commitment to the survival of Israel. So I, I am mad at Netanyahu, but I stand by Israel. This is a classic establishment Democrat politician approach. You got to find something to make the the squad voters and, uh, you know, to make the AOC wing of the party, you got to give them something. But yeah, ultimately got to stay on the, on the side of, of Israel on this as a Democrat too. So there's this frustration. You see this playing out, especially among some of the younger, uh, the younger Democrats in Congress who are pushing racial Marxism. The squad comes to mind among others. Uh, the, the people that are pushing those ideas They view Israel-Palestine through that lens, and so they see this as an opportunity to, you know, to make gains, if you will, in that regard, to to make the case. Whereas Dick Durbin's been in the game a long time, and you know, he says, "I'm going to stand by Israel." At the at the end of the day, I'm with Israel. He's saying, but you know, I I don't like Netanyahu. He's the bad guy here. 
any Israeli prime minister would react to firing to Hamas firing thousands of rockets in this way. Any Israeli prime minister, any of them would do this. You know, I mean, if, if you had Bernie Sanders as the prime minister of Israel, he would fi- he would have the IDF going and, and hunting down Hamas firing rockets, because if you didn't, your own people, your the, the citizens, the the people who live in the state of Israel would think you've lost your mind and they would oust you immediately. Right. Well, this is what are you going to sit there and just let the Iron Dome keep shooting down rockets, keep shooting down rockets. Because remember, that's not the only thing. That's not the only effort at terrorism that comes from the Palestinian, uh, Ham- Palestinian Hamas. That's not the only thing they're trying to do. So you have to take the fight to them. Once they've established these hostilities, you know, it's sort of like if, if somebody in a bar takes a, a swing at you with a bottle, maybe you're, not, and you're able to knock the bottle out of their hand, you're still going to punch them in the face because you know the next thing they're going to do is take a swing at you. As I've said, very straightforward, but Democrats make this all so much more complicated than it needs to be because they bring the wrong ideas, the wrong framework uh, in their approach to this. They just, they don't accept that there can be, in their minds, the, the way they see this is that the Palestinians are brown, oppressed, Muslim, and suffering from colonialism. A colonial project. That is the way the left views the problem of the Palestinians. Um, the way people that understand the situation of Israel today and where the country is, is you've got a place that has made numerous overtures at serious peace deals that have always been rebuffed, that lives next door to a terrorist group, Hamas, that is the government now of Gaza and openly says and seeks the destruction of Israel and wants to murder as many Israelis as possible and celebrates the, the shedding of Israeli blood, men, women, and children, whenever it can. Se- openly celebrates it. Israel has civilian casualties in its military strikes and says, this is terrible, we are sorry, we try to minimize this as much as possible. Hamas says, we wish we could kill all of you. This is not the same thing. They're not on the same moral playing field. And we need to be very clear about that. But Democrats, you see, their, their confusion about Israel and Palestinians is very much a mirror image of their confusion of issues in this country. You know, who, who's the cause of violence on American streets? Police? That's absurd. That's idiotic. But where is the focus? All of it from the left, all the focus from the establishment or the establishment of the left is on anti-cop rhetoric because of police violence, even at a time we have surging homicides in this country because they they have a framework. What's the framework in this country that there is uh, a there's a disproportionate number of uh, people of from communities of color who are shot by law enforcement. And even though the overall number of people shot by law enforcement is actually quite small, that violence is far more important to focus on by a factor of a thousand than the actual thousands and thousands of people being killed in American cities and towns across the country year in and year out that have nothing to do with police. And in fact, larger numbers of people dying because of the Democrat narrative about police as the bad guys. You see, corrupt illogical, immoral ideas have consequences, whether you're applying it to what's going on right now in the fight against Hamas or you're applying it to so-called police reform efforts in this country. Should we be worried about the variants? Um, I think we would be remiss to say that um, we are out of the woods. Um, This this pandemic, this virus has 
sent us too many curveballs to say that we, um, we too early to declare victory. Um, certainly with virus circulating in other parts of the world, that is in, in high degree that uh, gives the opportunity for more variants to emerge. Um, so I still, um, it's among the things that keeps me up at night. Um, but right now, the variants that we see here, and we're doing a lot of sequencing now. Not out of the woods. Not out of the woods. This is what we have to hear now. Because of the variants. You know, just let it go, CDC. Leave us alone. Just stop. Stop being crazy, CDC. Stop. But they won't. I got Rochelle Walensky. You know, she'll change what she says next week. Remember, you are not to question what the CDC tells you. But the CDC can change its mind whenever it wants. <laughs> oh, okay. So it's written in stone, but they'll just bring out a new stone and chisel something else on it. I, I see how this goes. I get it now. There's a need, a very clear need. to Do everything we can here to get people out of this lockdown COVID forever mindset. Because as you're already seeing, I think people are quite aware of it, there, is a whole, there are a whole lot of folks out there who don't want to let this go. There are a lot of people whose attitude about all of this is they're going to keep masking up for at least months, if not years, and they still don't think it's safe. And you see this first and foremost with the desire to continue masking children, which is, I, I think it's abuse. I mean, there's different levels of child abuse, right? I mean, people argue, you know, some people would argue that taking a, you know, a hairbrush and spanking your kid with it or something, you know, hard is, is child abuse. Uh, other people would say, well, if, you know, you t touch a kid's hand to a, like a hot iron, that's, you know, criminal child abuse. And you should go to you should be arrested for that. Um, but this is abuse. I mean, strapping a mask on a kid and saying, go, go play outside with your friends go play sports, go, go do competitive athletic endeavors as a 10-year-old or a 12-year-old, and you got to wear a mask, uh, this is absurd. And I find it very troubling that there are so many Americans who are willing to go along with this, who are, are willing to say uh, that this is okay. Of course it's not okay. They should know that it is not okay. So why the confusion? Why the issue? Because they've been brainwashed um, by the CDC. Because they're incapable of thinking for themselves on this one. Because we've had so much. I mean, the mass media. And it's, it's what's on your TV screens. But it's also, it's your computer. It's your smartphone. It's just the constant inundation with Fauciite propaganda has been enormously destructive. Oh, and then there's Pelosi, who is running around saying that you still have to wear a mask on the floor of Congress. You still, you have to do it. Play 12. Members are reminded that the announced policies of January 4th, 2021, as updated on May 11th, remain in effect with respect to the wearing of masks. The chair will reiterate that members and staff are currently required to wear masks at all times in the hall of the house, except when a member has been recognized by the chair or when a member acting as chair is speaking. This is busybody hall monitor control on steroids. You know, you, you don't have to wear it in a lot of other places in, in the Congress, but when you're, when you're actually on the floor of Congress, you got to, you know, with the cameras there. And because Pelosi says so, because she has control there and she's going to wield that control. Um, many of us saw this coming all along, so it's, it's not even the least bit surprising. But to see how they don't even pretend it's about disease and epidemiology anymore. It's not. It's because we say so. It's because our team, your team, Democrats became team mask. Double mask, even when outside, alone, and vaccinated. Double mask, because we're Democrats, and it's so important to us, and we're, we've internalized all this. And then the other side was, why are you being so crazy? 
You know, yeah, maybe there were some people on the right who were a little bit uh, less concerned, a little bit too lax about some of their, you know, exposure to possible COVID at different times. I'm sure that's a real thing. But by and large, the conservative position on this has just been don't be crazy, follow the actual data that you have, be reasonable about what works and what doesn't. And that has been a huge problem for the left, for the Democrats. They had to be on board for all this because the moment they started to allow, this is why the reversal of the mask mandate is such a big deal to them, or at least the removal, temporary, I believe, removal of a mask mandate from the, from the CDC at the federal level uh, is so important. The, the moment that they have to admit that one thing is stupid, it opened up a hundred other things they've made us done as being stupid, right? When the, the second that they can say it's anything other than because we say so, then we get to say, well, hold on a second. If you admit that vaccinated people, yeah, it's not perfect, but they're safe enough that they shouldn't have to wear masks. Why, why did you say that we had to wear masks outside all this time again? Why did you say that we should have been doing this when we go into a restaurant, but not when we sit down at a restaurant? I mean, there's a huge list of things you can point to. You say, well, this makes absolutely no sense. Huge list of things that just is, is utterly bizarre, stupid, counterproductive, arbitrary. And now we can all see it for ourselves, clear as day. But Pelosi, still what you, you, you have to mask because I, cause I said so. House Democrats vote in favor of a January 6th commission, a 9-11 style commission for the January 6th insurrection, also known as, as a riot for which people have already begun to serve solitary confinement sentences for crimes, including uh, vandalism and trespassing. Kurt Schlichter is with us now. He is a senior writer at townhall.com. He's also a veteran and a lawyer and a guy who knows many things. Kurt, great to have you. Great to be here. The January 6th commission is not going to be anything other than an extension, really, of what we've seen in the past in situations like this, whether it's the two impeachments against Trump or the Russia, Russia special counsel probe of Mueller, uh, where this is just going to be used for propaganda purposes. Or, or am I missing something, Kurt? No, you're not missing. This is a festival of onanism. It'll do nothing but give transitory pleasure to the Democrats and allow them to distract from President Asterisk's unbroken track record of failure. Uh, gas lines, war in the Middle East, inflation. It's like Jimmy Carter's coming back without the competence. Amazing to see how quickly things have unraveled. And, and I would even note that the, the border for me is the one that's the, the most obvious and direct failure of the Biden administration, as in they ch he changed the, the approach, he changed the rules and the floodgates were open. But you name all these other things, too. I mean, the economy, the economy right now should be a rocket ship that everyone feels like they're just trying to get a piece of. And instead, people are really concerned about inflation, really concerned that we may uh, stall out or even sputter and start heading in the wrong direction. And, and it just goes to show you, I mean, we're, we're reliving so many of the failures of the Obama years all over again because Democrats take the wrong lessons from the pain that we, the American people, have to go through. Well, Buck, I think you're missing the bigger point here and why we should be celebrating, which is no mean tweets. We don't have a guy in the White House being mean to celebrities and other politicians of both parties, to the extent there are two parties. Uh, we have no mean tweets, and we should be, I, I guess... I guess that should be enough. Now, it's not enough for you or for me or for our listeners, but I guess that makes us bad people. It's stunning that the journos uh, out there are still trying to, to, to push the storyline of an insurrection. I mean, this is the it's a term they use very intentionally, you know, and, and I, I see the propagandistic uh, effect of it, Kurt, the same way that they always talked about Russia collusion which was always fascinating because collusion is not a crime unless you're 
colluding to fix prices or something as a company. But this Russia collusion, there was a federal statute that they could have referenced Russia conspiracy, but they always wanted to leave it open. They, you know, it was all about narrative creation. So even if they didn't find a crime, collusion was almost like a willingness to think about this other crime that Trump didn't actually do. You see this now with, with the way they use the word insurrection to make it sound like there was a real uh, serious effort to overthrow the United States government. I mean, it, it, this if you would had, you know, how, how many people would it really take to deal with QAnon shaman? And if they went in there and they were using there was some lethal force used, as we know, against Ashley Babbitt. But if there was a broader usage of, of lethal force against the, those people, the reason it didn't happen is because they weren't using lethal force, meaning the protesters inside the building. How can you have it? How can you have a bloodless coup, so to speak? Well, with the blood's on one side, as we know, when you have people who are unarmed and taking selfies inside the Capitol building. Well, you can't and you don't. And I I think this is just uh, uh, for liberals uh, who watch CNN, uh, M- uh, MSNB, CNN, uh, you know, to essentially uh, uh, kill time and distract between Biden failures. Uh, now, look, you <clears throat> were in a country torn by a civil war. I've spent time in a country torn by a civil war, and I was in a real insurrection here in Los Angeles, egged on by Maxine Waters. I'm talking about the L.A. riots. I served in the army for three weeks on the streets. So to those of us who are, you know, adults with experience outside of gender studies seminars and uh, the uh, uh, MSNBC green room, this is not only a joke, but it's a joke in bad taste. And I think that they're overstepping. I mean, normal people look at this and they start seeing the video footage, which the federal government is attempting to suppress remarkably. And they're seeing these guys saying, yeah, we're going to be peaceful and the cops ain't come on in. As a lawyer, I love this. And I can't. And, and, and have you noticed that the uh, uh, feds are doing everything they can to push off these trials? You have a right to a speedy trial. In in certain circumstances, the government can ask for more time, and it has. It's trying to push it out. If I was representing any of these guys, and I don't do criminal law, but if I was representing any of these guys, I'd say no, 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 no waiver of time. You take us to trial. Oh, by the way, under Brady, I want every foot of film you took. I want every inch of video, every single one to defend my client. It's amazing how they've used this. They've weaponized this. It's it's a a club with which they bludgeon all political opponents. Now, all GOP, conservative, Trump supporters, everybody. The insurrection. We're speaking to Kurt Schlichter. My insurrection. Yeah, we're speaking to Kurt Schlichter. He's a veteran a senior writer at townhall.com. And, and Kurt, uh, you know, I actually wanted you to tell us a little bit about because you said you spent time in the military when you were deployed on the streets of Los Angeles during what really did feel like an insurrection. What was what was going on? I mean, I, you know, th- this does not get the attention uh, in in our you know, collective historical memory that it should. What was that like? Well, you know, I compare it to Capitol Hill, which looked like, uh, you know, except for a unknown federal officer murdering an unarmed trespasser um it, it, you know that seemed like uh, uh, a fairly tame frat party now in los angeles stuff was on fire people were getting shot you know your nostrils were filled with smoke and in my hands i had a m16 a1 because it was national guard and we still had the a1 fully automatic real world assault rifle and a bunch of ammo it was serious stuff it was real. And what happened on Capitol Hill was a joke. And we need to continue to treat it as a joke. And finally, some Republicans are starting to come around and treat it with the lack of seriousness it deserves. What do you make of the 35 GOP members who voted in the House along with this? I, I just Democrats don't have this. Democrats don't have elected officials on key issues, on important moments decide to spit in the face of their base of their party of their own side it is a constant you know it's like the romneyite disease it is a constant challenge for the gop 
Yes. Well, there are less of them now. But remember that the, the left has an advantage to keep its people in line. It has the media and the culture and the institutions and, and to try and force our people over. It can tempt them with the media, the culture and the institutions. I mean, Liz Cheney, who represents a fraction of a fraction of Republicans, who's got a, a poll rating in Wyoming that's right down there with pedophiles is getting uh, shots on every single media outlet, and not just little hits, long, in-depth interviews because she's the conscience of the Republican Party. Now, as fun as it is to see the Democrats uh, tongue-bathing a Cheney, it's bizarre that anyone could take her seriously as anything else but a puppet and a willing one. She's essentially dancing for quarters. We're speaking to Kurt Schlichter, veteran, townhall.com, senior writer and lawyer. And Kurt, uh, do you think do you think that there's any chance that this commission actually goes through that that the Senate would allow this? I think that uh, we will find 41 people to block it. I think when uh, Mitch McConnell, who is no who was not happy with the president and not happy what happened on Capitol Hill. I think uh, he understands absolutely that this is designed to be the lead news item for the next year and a half, as opposed to the disaster that is the Biden administration. And no one is more persuasive than the murder turtle. Now, we, we all have, look, as hardcore conservatives, we all have some beefs with uh, uh, McConnell. That's no secret. But you got to give him his due. He is the uh, toughest, most ruthless, most effective Senate majority leader probably of all time. He is unbelievably good at his job. And if he doesn't want this to happen, it will unhappen. And yet the media will continue to do their own version of the January 6th commission day after day. They'll find ways to continue to bring this up. And, and I, I think it's interesting that there's, there's been so little attention paid to the fact that you know, there were, the fact that there's a video, for example, that is out there and that people have seen where you have Capitol Hill police saying, OK, if you guys are going to be cool, you can come into the building now. I, you know, I, I can tell you that if I were, you know, if I were here in New York City in, uh, in City Hall and I was armed by the state to protect the building, I, I would not allow an insurrectionist if I really thought that's what's going on or just walk in and hang out and take selfies. Well, look, uh, I, I don't think a lot of these are going to trial. I think they're trying to push it off as long as possible. Um, I think one guy's pleading guilty and agreed to give evidence. Uh, he should be the only one that uh, incoming President DeSantis or whatever woke Republican uh, replaces this desiccated old weirdo who's currently president uh, when he comes into office and pardons every single one of them. Not because anything they did was particularly right or okay, but because of simple fairness, BLM and Antifa scumbags don't get treated that way. They get their charges dismissed. Fair is fair. One set of rules, one set of laws. Yeah, there's people who are sitting in solitary confinement right now. And the judges that refuse to give them bail because they were there on January 6th, at, you know, they were riding on January 6th inside the Capitol building. Kurt, I'm, I don't know if you've seen this, but the, but at least in one case, a judge has said we can't let you out because of the continued threat of insurrection. This is in, this is insane. I mean, that is actually Soviet level absurdity and, and, and real abuse of state power. Uh, it really is. And when you have judges who uh, do not judge fairly or correctly, that destroy that, that it's not only wrong in itself, it destroys the faith in the system. And your faith in the system should be uh, teetering on the precipice right now. The fact is there are two sets of laws, Buck. There is one set of law for people favored by the regime. There is another set of law for people like you and me and all our listeners. That is intolerable. We've tolerated this long because we're not used to it. This is not normal, and people are resistant to accepting it. And, and you can see that with some Republicans. You, you see them a while ago, no, 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 trust the system. And now they're going, yeah, I've just seen a little too much. Now I know there's a real problem. People are getting woke, conservative woke, to what's really happening. And as people pull up to the gas pump 
and pull out their wallets and find they're paying over five bucks a gallon for gas because uh, President Asterisk uh, wants to cater to the weather cultists, they're going to start thinking, you know, the news keeps talking about the insurrection, but I'm running out of money to feed my family. Who's going to stand up for me? And that and is the, the opportunity. Is hopefully us. That's the opportunity yeah. the GOP has. We will see if they take it. Kurt Schlichter, everybody, townhall.com for his latest pieces. Kurt, always a pleasure, man. Talk to you soon. Thanks. 